When people find out that I study coral reefs and technical dive for a living, they always have a lot of questions. Usually it starts something along the lines of, oh my god, sharks! And then we go somewhere else from there. Nowadays, inevitably, we wind up going pretty much the same place with everybody. Some people ask it gently, they, they tiptoe around the issue, other times they're a little more blunt. But inevitably we wind up with something along the lines of, how can you do what you do when everything you love is dying? It's kind of a brutal question. It's not really what I thought I'd be dealing with when I was four years old, snorkeling with my grandfather and decided this was going to be my life. Uh, but it's really not hard to understand how people get there. Five minutes on Google got me these. So pessimism, apathy, a general avoidance of these issues is all sort of understandable if this is what you're reading. Now the thing is, we have lost a lot of coral reefs, but this isn't the whole story. Tonight I'm not going to tell you that we've found a silver bullet to fix the problem or that we won't lose more coral in the future. But what I am going to tell you is a small part of this story that, that almost no one ever gets to hear. One that's a little bit more positive than the rest and one that I get to work on every day. By the end of this, you'll know my answer to that first question and just maybe you'll have a little bit of hope for the future of coral reefs. So to start off, what is a coral reef and why should you care? In a nutshell, reefs are food on our tables and roofs over our heads. The World Wildlife Fund estimates that up to one billion people throughout the world, throughout the tropics, get their food, their paychecks, or both from coral reefs. So the fact that we're losing them is kind of a big problem, right? Coral reefs are created by these squishy, colorful looking rocks that are actually an animal living with algae. And as they photosynthesize, they lay down layer after layer after layer of skeleton, make, forming those rocks that you can see in these videos. And those rocks provide habitat for one of the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet, as diverse as any rainforest you've ever seen. And more importantly, perhaps, these provide habitat space for some really tasty things. Things like grouper, snapper, lobster, and crabs. So as these ecosystems are dying, it's really important, especially in an island like this, where you can look around this room and see people who make their living off of these things, it's really important that we find ways to, to study them and try to help protect them. Now, in the territory, since about 2001, we've been uh, undertaking the Virgin Islands Territorial Coral Reef Monitoring Program. Part of the, it's, a, an organ, or it's part of the National Oceanographic Administration, administered through UVI. Once a year, we go to each of these 33 red dots, which each represent a coral reef, and we measure the amount of coral that's there, the health of the coral, and the fish that are living in those ecosystems. So a couple of things you can notice from this, St. Thomas and St. John are in the north, St. Croix is in the south. Um, there is that sort of black hole in there in between the islands. That's called the Anagata Passage. That area is actually over two miles deep. And so it means that the reefs in St. Croix are, are a little bit different than the reefs up here in St. Thomas and St. John. So for tonight, I'm just going to focus up here in the northern islands. Everything I'm about to say does apply in some way or another to St. Croix. But just keep, to keep things simple without having to explain all the different environments, I'll just focus up here. So there are 19 red dots on this screen. They each represent a specific reef that we study. And what you can tell, first of all, is that they're all distributed everywhere, right? And we have some on the north side of St. Thomas, we have some close to shore, then there are a handful of them that are way offshore on the south drop. So all these reefs aren't created equal, and we selected them to try and get a good coverage and a good example, representative sample of everything of all the reefs in the Virgin Islands. So, you saw all those headlines, right? That's the big world. Well, what's happening here? This is the only graph I'm going to show you tonight, I promise. So, in 2003, when the program really got going, coral cover was up around 26, 27 percent on average. If you've been here since then, you might remember that in 2005 and 2006, we had a really, really hot summer. Temperature is what kills coral. They can't move, and if they get above a certain temperature, they get stressed out, they get sick, they die. So during that year, we actually lost 40% of the coral in the Northern Virgin Islands, St. Thomas and St. John. But again, this is 19 reefs, right? And we show, I showed you that they were all in different places, some of them are different depths, some of them are close to shore, far from shore. And so this average line is actually kind of hiding something really interesting. 
So what I'm going to do is just draw a line at 100 feet, okay? And the first line I'm going to add to this is all the reefs shallower than 100 feet. These are the reefs that you can scuba dive on if you're a recreational diver. They're the reefs that you snorkel on when you go from shore. They've been hit much harder than the rest of the reefs. These are 14 of those 19 reefs in the northern BI. They started out lower in 2003, down around 22, 23 percent, and they wound up losing 60 percent of their coral versus the 40 for the average. So what about those other five sites? These reefs below 100 feet are called mesophotic or twilight zone reefs. And this is really the whole purpose of why I'm up here tonight. They look like this. So not only did they start up at 36, 37 percent coral back in 2003, they did lose a little bit in 2005, about 15 percent drop. But even today, they're up at 29 percent. So those five reef systems are still doing better than the average reef was in 2003. So it's a pretty cool story. Now why is that? So these deep reefs, they, they're below 100 feet and they're generally far from shore. So it means they get less pollution, they're damaged less by human activities like anchoring and things like that. But most importantly, they have an average temperature that's about two degrees cooler than all those shallow reefs. So when you go beyond the depth of recreational scuba diving, you wind up with reefs that are just a little bit more buffered from those hot summers that can kill all this coral. And so what we found is that these, these reefs out here, they're huge, they're thriving, and they're supporting endangered species and all kinds of tasty things for our islands. So we come back to this graphic. Now I've changed it a little bit. The land is still colored black, but what I've done is the colorful area outside of that land is now only between one and 300 feet. And you can still see the 19 sites for the territorial monitoring program up here. Now you see those ones on the south drop. Those are those really good ones. But with five reef sites, we sort of, we wanted to ask the question, well, what is this huge space around us? What, what's the potential for these reefs out here? I mean, it's 435 square, square miles. So studying that is a little difficult for little old UVI with a handful of professors, a handful of staff, and a handful of graduate students. So when I moved here five years ago, we set out to develop a method that would allow us to sample these reefs in a way that we could manage. And what we rested on was a set of GoPros in really deep water housings that would take pictures for us. The nice thing about this is when we dive to 220 feet, you have to spend hour, you spend over an hour getting out of the water. It's dangerous. And so using this system allows us to check out reefs before we go dive them. You set it to take pictures every 10 seconds, throw it into the water, get a good one, and lay points over it. The ratio of coral points to the total tells you how much coral is at that site. It's pretty simple. We reduced the cost of sampling a reef by 95 percent. We've also made our world a lot safer. So we're back to this one, right? We've been talking about these five, re or, yeah, these five deep reefs, these 19 total reefs that we've been monitoring up here. Since 2012, we've used that system, that camera system, to sample 416 reefs across the northern part of the territory. To do that, diving would have taken many, many more days, probably tenfold the number of days that we put into this work. What's even cooler about this is that 85 percent of those pink dots, 85 percent of those drops had some kind of coral in them. That doesn't mean they all look like that last one that I showed you, but many of them do, especially in this area. So if you know anything about the south drop, you know that we have two protected reef areas out here. In that purple box, based on our data and a very conservative estimate, we believe there are more than 200 million living coral colonies right now, in 2017, when all you read are those headlines about reefs dying. It's amazing. These reefs are a jewel of the Caribbean. It's one of the only places out here where things are still holding on and thriving. It's pretty cool. Now, I want to tell you a tale, a bit of a precautionary tale, about why we need to study these reefs and why we need to do it quickly. I'm going to tell you about Ginsburg's Fringe. It's a reef on the last drop into the Anagata Passage, just south of the Gramonic Bank closure. It's in 220 feet of water. To get down there and spend 20 minutes, it takes us 70 minutes to decompress on our rebreathers. Not only that, sometimes some big things come to say hello. But what's amazing about Ginsburg's Fringe is we really discovered this reef, started understanding it in 2008, and we only put it into the monitoring program in 2011. Back then, it had 44% coral cover, 
higher than just about any other known reef that we've studied in the territory. But this reef sits just outside the Gramonic Bank closure, because when that closure was made, nobody knew this existed. So the Gramonic Bank is a no fishing, no anchoring zone that's a really well protected and beautiful reef that's part of that really healthy system I showed you. The problem is, this area not being protected, we're starting to see these, anchors. People are fully legally, and but perhaps without knowing, throwing their anchors onto this reef so they can fish outside of the closed area. And it's looking like this now. Since 2011, Ginsburg's fringe has dropped from 44% cover to 22. It's lost half of its coral. Not because of climate change, not because of illegal fishing or illegal anything, but because of ignorance. Because we don't know these reefs exist. And so the reason that this is so important to me is because if we don't look for these things, if we don't find them, understand them, and protect them, we're going to be losing reefs we don't even know we have. So that's a bit of a bummer, I know, but we still have 200 million coral colonies in that space, so it's still all right. We're doing really well. And like I said, we're one of the only areas in the Eastern Caribbean that has marine protected areas on these reefs. So all around, it's a really positive story. So it got us thinking, we had gone from these five deep reefs that were really incredible. We had expanded out to the northern VI and understood, hey, there's a lot of hope here. There's a lot of stuff going on that we don't understand, that aren't described and aren't studied. But what does that mean elsewhere? So we went from home and we went into the neighborhood. So this is something I'm working on daily. This is a map of uh, mesophotic reef potential in the Eastern Caribbean. I know that Barbados, Trinidad, and Tobago should be on this map. I didn't forget them. I just, they aren't ready yet. I'm still working on it. Uh, but what you can see here, I've left the colorful map we were looking at for St. Thomas and St. John up there. And all the other colorful areas are shelves like ours that could have coral reefs like ours. So for instance, we know Saba, if you know that island, that area is full of coral like ours. But there are all these, all these other systems like the Anguilla, St. Martin, St. Bart shelf, the Antigua, Barbuda shelf, St. Vincent and Grenadines and Grenada shelf that have huge potential areas for these coral reefs where corals could be clinging to life in this changing ocean of ours. The thing is, nobody's looked at it. If just 5% of the space that I'm showing you right now looks like our reefs, that's 2 million acres of healthy living coral reef that's not known, not talked about, not protected. So there's work in that, but there's also a lot of hope. And that's what I get to work on every day. So when people ask me that question, how can you do what you do when everything you love is dying? I don't sugarcoat it. I tell them, yeah, we've lost more coral in my lifetime than the past 10 lifetimes. But we haven't even looked at half of the seafloor that could have coral reefs on it. And where we have, here in the VI, the coral reefs are unlike anything else that you can see, diving, snorkeling recreationally. And they're still doing really well. And for me, that's hope. For me, that's a chance for the future. So it's about this time in the, conver in the conversation that people ask me their final question. What can I do? How can I help? And what I tell them is, you have to take stock of every part of your life. Be mindful of the way that your choices, the things you consume, the waste you produce, how that affects the world around you. And that, that goes for anybody living here on an island surrounded by reefs in the ocean, or if you live up in the States in the middle of the country. Your choices matter. Where you throw your anchor, what food you eat, what waste you produce. Think on those things and you might help, help out. Thank you very much.